So good evening. It is a great honor to speak to you. I see in the audience California Indian dignitaries, California Indian elders, scholars, and students. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to hear the story and the history that I will present to you this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge two things. First, the material that we're going to cover is very difficult. It's particularly difficult if for you this material is a wound that is unhealed in your community or in your own soul. And so I'd like to invite you, if at any time you need to go outside to get a breath of fresh air or to offer a few prayers, just to have some solitude for yourself, I welcome you to do that. And I would ask that if someone needs to get up in the middle of the presentation, people in the audience, just let that person go quietly. And, and help them to do what they need to do. The second thing that I want to acknowledge before we begin is that we are in Indian country. We are on Indian land. Your college sits on Indian land. And I'd like everybody to stretch out your arm just for a moment. If you look at your arm, that is the entire length of human habitation here in California. The part that is colonialism that involves pale people like me is just that little white part at the end of your fingernail. So we are talking about one small portion, one very small portion of a much, much larger indigenous history here. When you leave campus tonight, you'll be on Indian land. Wherever you go in the state of California, you'll be in Indian country. In fact, anywhere you go in this hemisphere, from the shores of the Arctic Sea to the tip of Patagonia, you will be in some indigenous people's ancestral territory. If there's one thing you come away from this evening thinking about, I'd like you to think about that, that wherever you go in the Americas, you are in Indian country. The ceremony continued until just before dawn, illuminated by a central fire. Celebrants swayed together in ancient rhythms the women's clamshell necklaces clicking gently against their necklaces, their beaded dresses, and the rest of their paraphernalia. Male dancers stood between them, supporting them. Dressed as birds, deer, foxes, or hunters. Meanwhile, singers raised their voices heavenward in the ancient incantations of Nidash, the feather dance ceremony, celebrating not only the creation of the world, but its continuous renewal in each new moment. Finally, the celebrants walked away from the ceremony under a full moon, arm in arm. They entered snug redwood houses through small round doorways and entered areas under peaked roofs where they bedded down next to kith and kin. They were unaware that less than seven miles away, white men in Crescent City, not far from the Oregon border, were preparing to unleash the next episode in California's ever-expanding killing campaigns. Crescent City's Coast Rangers and Klamath Mounted Rangers had been well armed by California Governor John Bigler. In January of 1854, the state's quartermaster general had sent the county judge 50 muskets, 10 rifles, and 1,000 rounds of ammunition. By November, the Coast Rangers had 35 rifles, 1,000 cartridges. By November, they had yet more. The Klamath Rangers, meanwhile, received 50 rifles from the state arsenal. These heavily armed volunteer state militiamen now prepared to do one thing and one thing only, kill California Indian people. In the pre-dawn hours of the final day of 1854, as many as 116 militiamen, accompanied by an unknown number of vigilantes, quietly took up concealed positions in the brush surrounding the village. At daybreak, as Talawa men, women, children and elders and their guests emerged to begin the day, the militiamen and vigilantes opened fire. They shot, said one eyewitness, 
just as fast as they could reload their weapons. Some of the Indian people gathered their plunge into the waters of Lake Earl and attempted to swim across the lake, seeking safety on the opposite shore. But there, too, they encountered concealed snipers lying in wait. When the screaming and the shooting finally stopped, almost all of the Indian people in the village were dead, perhaps 160 to 300 or more individuals. Meanwhile, the vigilantes and the militiamen suffered just one casualty. The state of California later paid them for their work. Between the years 1846 and 1870, California's indigenous population plunged from perhaps 150,000 people to perhaps 30,000 people. What caused this catastrophe? Diseases, exposure, dislocation, malnutrition, and starvation all played a part. But something more sinister was also happening. Abduction. Unfree labor, mass death on reservations, assaults, rape, individual homicides, battles, and over 300 separate massacres took thousands of lives and hindered California Indian reproduction. This was, in fact, a case of genocide. In an international court, for a prosecutor, to successfully convict a defendant of the crime of genocide, they must prove two things. First, that the defendant evinced intent to destroy in whole or in part a particular group of people. That's the first part. And the second thing that they must do is they must commit one of the five internationally recognized genocidal crimes. The UN Genocide Convention thus provides scholars like me with a clear, internationally recognized rubric for evaluating possible instances of genocide, including historical cases that are not subject to legal jurisdiction. Now, following the signing of this international legal treaty in 1948, scholars began to carefully re-examine the conquest and the colonization of California by the United States. And by the year 2000, over 20 scholars had deemed what happened in California between 1846 and 1873 to, in fact, have been a case of genocide. Still, relatively little has been written about the genocide that took place in California, at least compared to the more canonical cases of genocide, such as the Holocaust, Armenia, or Cambodia. So the book that I'm going to present to you this evening in American Genocide is the very first year-by-year, month-by-month, meticulous and methodical accounting of the genocide that took place here in our state during these catastrophic years. I spent over 10 years researching and writing this book. Why? Because the question of genocide in California history calls for meticulous attention to detail because the stakes are so high, not only for scholars like me and your professors, but also for California Indian people and for all individuals living in the United States. If US citizens founded some regions of the state of California, if not the state as a whole, upon deliberate attempts to physically annihilate indigenous peoples. Scholars will need to reevaluate some of the basic axioms that we use to think about and to analyze US history. Scholars could, for example, re-examine the assumption that indirect effects of colonialism, like epidemic disease, rather than direct effects of colonialism, like mass murder, were the leading cause of death in all encounters between natives and newcomers. Exceptionalist interpretations of US history, which suggest that the history of the US is somehow entirely different from the histories of all other nations on the planet, lose validity as researchers 
like myself, begin to compare the mass violence that took place in California's conquest and colonization to the mass violence that took place in the conquest and colonization of other parts of the Earth. For example, in my own work, I compare what happened in California to what happened in various regions of Australia. A careful study of genocide here in California will also assist scholars in examining the larger hemispheric indigenous population catastrophe. Where scholars document the genocide, it will become necessary to carefully evaluate what roles local, state, or federal governments played, as well as whether or not mass violence was part of a local recurring phenomenon, or a national phenomenon, or even a hemispheric one. <coughs> Excuse me. Larger questions then follow. What tended to catalyze genocide? Who ordered the killing? Who carried out the killing? Why do we not know more about these events? Did democracy drive the process of mass destruction? And ultimately, what role did genocide play in the making of the modern United States, Canada, Mexico, and the other nations of the Western Hemisphere? Given its political, economic, psychological, and human health ramifications, the genocide question is particularly urgent for California's 150,000 California Indian people. Should California Indian leaders press for government apologies, reparations, or control of the lands on which these genocidal events took place? Will tribal leaders marshal evidence of genocide in cases involving state and federal government officials, tribal sovereignty, and federal recognition? How should tribal leaders commemorate victims of mass murder while also emphasizing accommodation, resistance, survival, and ongoing cultural renewal? The psychological issues related to genocide are likewise fraught. What happens if a tribal member learns that he or she is the descendant of both genocide perpetrators and genocide survivors? How might California Indian people reconcile increased knowledge of the genocide that took place here, often at the hands of US officials, with their own often intense patriotism? Finally, what role might acknowledgement of genocide play in the recognition and addressing of intergenerational historical trauma and that trauma's direct connection to present day physical illnesses, substance abuse, violence, and extraordinarily high rates of suicide. Now the question of genocide in California also poses explosive questions for everyone living in the United States. Should government officials publicly tender apologies as did Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush in the 1980s for the forcible relocation and internment of some 120,000 Japanese Americans during the Second World War, many of them, by the way, citizens of the state of California? Should federal officials offer monetary compensation along the lines of the more than $1.6 billion that Congress has now paid out to those Japanese Americans and their heirs? Might California officials decrease their cut of California Indians' $7.3 billion a year in gaming revenues as a way of paying reparations? A better understanding of the genocide that took place in California might also impact the federal government's dealings with the over 70 California Indian communities currently seeking recognition by the US government. The question of commemoration is closely linked. Will non-Indian people support or even tolerate the public commemoration of mass murders committed by some of our state's forefathers with the same kinds of monuments, museums, and state legislated days of remembrance that today commemorate, for example, the Armenian genocide, the rape of Nanking, or the Holocaust? Will genocides against California Indian people join these systematic mass murders in public school curricula or in public discourse? <coughs>
These questions are all extremely important, but can only be addressed in very limited ways without a comprehensive understanding of the relations between natives and newcomers during these crucial early years of US rule here in California. Sporadic mass murder of California Indian people punctuated the initial years of US rule here in California, but it was James Marshall's famous 1848 gold strike that precipitated a local genocide. Oregon men migrating south to partake in the gold rush played a leading role in increasing violence against California Indian people. They rarely had connections to California's Hispanic economy and society in which indigenous people played very important, often integral roles. And many of these Oregonians saw California Indian people as little more than dangerous obstacles to the rapid acquisition of wealth. In the year 1849, Oregonian attacks on California Indian people increased in both frequency and lethality, particularly in the Nisanan and northern Miwok lands where the central mines were now booming. I can't reach up that high, but if you see the word Nisanan and you can see Sutter's Mill there on the screen, that's the area where this violence began to spread slowly outward like a bloodstain. 149er explained, and I quote, Oregon people had been used to shooting Indians, and they did shoot them freely. That April, one miner entered the epicenter of this local genocide, Coloma, at Sutter's Mill, where Marshall had first found gold. In the central mines, he and other eyewitnesses recounted multiple massacres, beheadings, scalpings, and the slaying of surrendered California Indian civilians including women, children, and elders. Due to spotty primary source coverage, we will probably never know precisely how many California Indian people perished in the central mines in 1849 and 1850. But it is plausible that hundreds, if not thousands, died there during this time. What was absolutely clear to contemporary observers was the exterminatory nature of such killings not only in their intent, but also in their impact. The slaying of two white ranchers near Clear Lake, which we can see here on the west side of Clear Lake, that's now in Lake County, in December 1849, marked the turning point toward a larger statewide genocide. In response to this double homicide, vigilantes and United States Army soldiers killed as many as 1,000 California Indian people, and likely far more, between the final days of 1849 and May 16, 1850. Vigilantes first murdered and massacred large numbers of California Indian farm and ranch workers in the Napa and Sonoma Valleys. Then, after authorities arrested some of these vigilantes, California's very first Supreme Court let them go on bail in their very first case, never to rearrest and try them. Meanwhile, the United States Army also sought to avenge the deaths of the two white ranchers. In an article titled, Horrible Slaughter of Indians, one San Francisco newspaper described a massacre committed at the north end of Clear Lake using information provided to them by a United States Army captain, and I quote, they poured in a destructive fire indiscriminately amongst them, men, women, and children. They fell as grass before the sweep of the scythe. Little resistance was encountered, and the work of butchery was of but short duration. Neither age nor sex was spared. It was the order of extermination, fearfully obeyed. As many as 800 people may have died on this infamous morning. Other killings followed, and the officers involved were not censured. In fact, they were promoted. All of them became generals. One of them became the governor of the state of California. A new factor was at work, large-scale, extended vigilante and U.S. Army killing campaigns tolerated by both state and federal authorities. <laughs> 
As the gold rush continued, newcomers surged into the state. Before the gold rush began in about 1846, there were perhaps 12,000 to 14,000 non-native people living in California. But by the year 1860, that number had surged to well more than 360,000 people. This was the single largest mass migration in the 19th century in the history of the United States. Now, the newcomers came primarily to seek wealth. They were looking for the glittering possibilities that gold offered. But in seeking to access gold, in seeking to eat, dress, feed themselves, and satisfy their sexual desires, immigrants placed immense pressures on California Indian communities. These demands triggered an explosion of ranching, hunting, mining, and slave raiding. These activities sent out shockwaves that had catastrophic effects on indigenous communities. And California's new leaders magnified that destructive impact. During the period of martial law between 1846 and 1850, US military leaders legislated California Indians into a position of second-class citizenship with few rights. California's 1849 Constitutional Convention delegates, who met here in this building, then made it nearly impossible for California Indian people to vote. Then, in the early months of 1850, California's state legislators met for the very first time, and one of their very first acts was to deny all California Indian people the right to vote, to bar Indians with one half of Indian blood or more, from getting evidence for or against whites in criminal cases, and banning all Indian people from juries. They later barred Indian people from serving as attorneys. In combination, these laws largely shut California Indian people out of participation in and protection by the state's legal system. Abduction played a major role in the California Indian population decline. In the year 1850, legislators passed what they called an Act for the Governance and Protection of Indians. Rarely has a government act been so misnamed. This legislation legalized the white custody of Indian minors and Indian prisoner leasing while allowing courts to summarily reject Indian testimony Indians could thus be forced into unpaid work on trumped up charges. What we're looking at here is something from Southern California. If you can't see it in the back, this is actually an ad selling a slave. It says, translated from the French, 16-year-old Southern California Indian female at the price of a pound of gunpowder and a bottle of brandy. In 1860, legislators extended the 1850 Act to legalize the indenture of any Indians, whether children or grown persons, including prisoners of war. Now, these two laws, the 1850 Act and the 1860 Act, had three devastating genocidal impacts on indigenous people. The first was the slave raiding itself. Were we a California Indian community and were slave raiders to come into this room in the early 1850s or 1860s, they would first of all kill most of us who are adult men. We would just be summarily executed. Women and children would be tied up and then taken away for sale or indenture. These were highly lethal slave raiding operations. People who then tried to escape after being captured were often summarily shot or beaten to death. There was a second genocidal thing going on with slave raiding, and that was that the very act of separating men and women, people would have been sold all over Southern California from this room, made it very difficult for communities to biologically reproduce themselves. And there was a third factor, and that was that because it was so inexpensive for slave raiders and slave owners to obtain California Indian people, they often treated these unfree workers 
as disposable. Again, to bring it back to where we live in Los Angeles, a lot greater Los Angeles area, one lawyer who worked here in the 1850s and 1860s recalled, and I quote, Los Angeles had its slave mart, and thousands of honest, useful people were absolutely destroyed in this way. Indeed, census takers tell us that between the year 1850 and 1860, LA's Indian population plummeted from 3,693 people to just 219. Escape was one way that California Indians defied servitude but whites sometimes responded with lethal force. For example, the Lucy Young pictured here, a Lassic Wailaki woman, escaped servitude multiple times. She recollected, and I quote, young woman been stole by white people, shot through lights and liver, front skin hang down like apron, she tie up with cotton dress, never die neither. Others were less fortunate. After one California Indian woman fled her, quote, lord and master with his Indian boy, end quote, in 1858, whites responded by massacring an entire village of 15 people. Two years later, a rancher on the Van Dusen River became so incensed after his Indian servant visited his family one half of one mile away that he, quote, slaughtered the whole family of six persons, boy and all. Despite such reports, which were all too common in California's media and in official reports, policymakers failed to intervene while almost all law enforcement officials turned a blind eye. The United States Congress, meanwhile, made California Indian people particularly vulnerable to immigration's blast. In 1851, and 1852, the federal Indian agents you see here in this photograph signed 18 separate treaties with 119 California Indian communities, allocating them 7,488,000 acres, or approximately 7% of California's land. However, in Washington, D.C., United States senators repudiated unanimously all 18 of these treaties while sitting in a secret session. Instead, in the year 1853, Congress authorized five military reservations not to exceed 25,000 acres each. And they conferred, and this is crucial, no land titles and no legal recognition on California Indian people under federal law. Now the results were fourfold. First, no reservations were patented. And this meant that jurisdiction over them remained uncertain. Second, California Indian people did not become the explicit wards of the federal government. Third, because jurisdiction remained uncertain and contested, confusion and conflict between and among state and federal authorities prevailed. Finally, U.S. Army Major General John Wool's 1857 interpretation of these temporary military reservation status denied them the Army's full protection, and I quote, until these reservations are perfected, the United States troops have no right to exclude whites from entering and occupying the reserves or even to prevent them from taking away women and children. Federal officials thus made California Indian people particularly vulnerable to kidnapping, rape, slavery, assault, homicide, and massacres. The establishment of California's new militia system then marked the rise of a state-sponsored killing machine. Between the years 1850 and 1861, 3,414 white militiamen enrolled in 24 separate volunteer militia campaigns against California Indian people, killing at least 3,142 of them. However, their impact transcended these numbers. Militiamen served as a widely publicized state endorsement of Indian killing, communicating an unofficial grant of legal impunity, 
and inspiring many more to become Indian killers. Indeed, vigilantes during this period killed more than 6,400 California Indian people. Such killers were not rogue operators. They were supported by the state of California. In January of 1851, California's first civilian elected governor, this man, Peter Burnett, declared, and I quote, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged until the Indian race becomes extinct. Soon thereafter, state legislators put the power of the purse behind anti-Indian anti militia campaigns. The very month after he made this speech, California legislators voted to borrow $500,000, a huge amount of money in this time in history, for both past and future anti-Indian militia operations. Meanwhile, the state began to build up in San Francisco an arsenal of weapons donated to them by the U.S. Army. The militia operations were expensive, and they quickly exhausted the first $500,000 that they had raised. And so in May of 1852, following a spate of lethal anti-Indian militia operations, the legislature passed a $600,000 bond measure to support additional operations against California Indians. What we're looking at here is one of these actual bonds. You can see George Washington on the right-hand margin. You can see a Haudenosaunee Indian warrior uh, up at the top there. And what is missing are the coupons. A bondholder would take the bond into a financial institution. The bank or the institution would then take off the coupon and make the bond payment. These bonds were quite remunerative. They paid out typically 7% interest, which was quite a good, uh, safe investment. And they came in a variety of denominations, which meant that some of the larger denominations were probably for institutional investors, like Wells Fargo, while smaller ones were for common citizens. So a wide variety of citizens became involved in directly supporting these killing operations. Now, for some California Indian people, the pattern of exterminatory acts was now becoming all too clear. After assaults by militiamen in the year 1854, one Modoc leader in the northeastern portion of California announced at a tribal gathering, we have lived here in peace, but cannot get along with the white people. They come and they kill my people for nothing. Not only my men, but they kill our wives and our children. He concluded, they will hunt us down as we hunt the deer and the antelope. The Sinkion woman, Sally Bell, from the Northwest Coast provided a rare California Indian eyewitness account of a massacre that took place in her homeland sometime in the middle 1850s. Bell remembered, and I quote, about 10 in the clock in the morning, some white men came. They killed my grandfather and my mother and my father. I saw them do it. They killed my baby sister and cut her heart out and threw it into the brush where I had run to hide. My little sister was just a baby, just crawling around. I didn't know what to do. I was so scared. I guess I just hid there for a long time with my little sister's heart in my hands. It was a terrifying time to be a California Indian. The United States Congress sitting in Washington, D.C. now endorsed such killings. In 1854, Congress allocated over $924,000 to reimburse the state of California for past militia campaigns. And a new surge of both militia and vigilante killings followed, even as state and federal leaders worked to perfect the killing machine. This man, state quartermaster and adjutant general Kibbe, wrote a book on tactics and made sure that it was distributed to each and every one of his militia officers who became increasingly efficient killers. Meanwhile, then Secretary of War Jefferson C. Davis sent to Kibbe as a Christmas present crates 
of manuals on tactics to be distributed to California militiamen. And then in 1857, state legislators appropriated an additional $410,000 for new campaigns with predictable results. Finally, in 1861, Congress appropriated an additional $400,000 to pay the expenses of nine additional militia expeditions. The United States congressmen thus indirectly sanctioned and supported the killings after the fact. Although California Indian people routinely resisted, state, federal, and civilian groups repeatedly tried to forcibly remove them to those temporary federal reservations that I mentioned earlier. And such operations were sometimes lethal. For example, in 1856, vigilantes massacred 55 Indian people in the process of forcibly removing one group to the Bendicino Reservation. The Lake Yakuts woman, Yoimut, recollected that during the forced removal of her community to the Fresno Reservation, soldiers killed 12 Indian people. Likewise, the known lackey man, Andrew Freeman, explained that when they took the Indians to Round Valley Reservation, they drove them like stock and they shot the old people who couldn't make the trip. They would shoot children who were getting tired. Once they arrived at reservations, California Indian people encountered institutionalized malnutrition and lethal starvation. The Concow leader, Tomeyanem, recollected that after volunteers had removed his community to Mendocino Reservation, and I quote, we were very hungry, and the Concows began to die very fast. Other reservations proved little better. In about 1860, Tomeyanem and his people were moved to, the, to Round Valley Reservation, where he recollected there was even less to eat. Indeed, in 1860, federal reservation officials provided just 410 to 980 calories per day to working Round Valley Indians. Meanwhile, the federal government cut monetary allocations for reservations in California. And by 1862, daily reservation rations at Round Valley had plummeted to just 160 to 390 calories per day to working Indians. The reservation possessed hundreds of cattle at this time. But policy was that, and I quote, Indians were allowed no meat. Now, if some Indian people on reservations in California died of institutionalized starvation, malnutrition weakened the immune systems of others, making them particularly susceptible to lethal diseases. Starvation and malnutrition also predictably depressed fecundity while increasing the numbers of miscarriages and stillbirths. Some reservation officials and colonists living on and near reservations also used reservation Indians as disposable labor with lethal results. According to one colonist, and I quote, about 300 died on the reservation during the winter of 1856 to 1857 from the effects of packing them through the mountains in the snow and mud. They were generally worked naked and packed 50 pounds if able. At California reservations, willful neglect took an untold number of lives. But federal officials also killed California Indian people in much more direct ways. During the US Civil War, 15,725 white California men enrolled in the United States Army. Thousands of them remained here in California, and they soon radically transformed California's killing machine. As US troops, these so-called California volunteers replaced relatively small, short-term militia operations with much larger, longer-term United States Army operations that sometimes lasted for years on end. The Army now fielded the most sustained campaigns yet seen in California's history. Vigilante operations flourished alongside these Army campaigns, but the genocide in California was now primarily a federal project. 
and U.S. Army forces killed substantial numbers. During their very first campaign in northwestern California in 1862, they killed at least 120 California Indian people. Hundreds more would die in succeeding campaigns led by officers like this man, Henry M. Black, a West Point graduate. California volunteers also killed surrendered California Indian prisoners on multiple occasions. Cavalry Captain Moses McLaughlin proudly reported from near Bakersfield how in 1863, quote, I had all the bucks collected together and 35 were either shot or sabered. None escaped, end quote. McLaughlin concluded with a statement that can only be interpreted as one of genocidal intent. They will soon be all either killed off or driven so far into the surrounding deserts that they shall perish by famine. The U.S. Army continued killing California Indians through the late 1860s and only stopped at the end of the 1872-1873 Modoc War when they hanged and decapitated four surrendered Modoc leaders before shipping their severed heads to Washington, D.C. The California Indian catastrophe fits the two-part legal definition of genocide set forth in the 1948 United Nations Genocide Convention. First, perpetrators demonstrated, both in word and in deed, their intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Second, they committed examples of all five of the genocidal crimes enumerated in the convention. Killing occurred in more than 370 massacres, as well as hundreds and hundreds of smaller killings, individual homicides, and official executions. Sources indicate that between the years 1846 and 1873, vigilantes, militiamen, and soldiers killed at least 9,492 to 16,094 California Indian people, and probably many, many more. By way of contrast, primary sources indicate that California Indian keep people killed fewer than 1,500 non-Indians during this entire period. Other acts of genocide proliferated too. Many rapes and beatings occurred. And these meet the convention's definition of causing serious bodily harm on the basis of the victim's identity and with the intent to destroy the victim's group in whole or in part. The sustained military and civilian policy of demolishing California Indian villages as well as their food supplies while driving survivors into inhospitable desert and alpine regions amounted to deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction in whole or in part. Some Office of Indian Affairs employees administering federal Indian reservations in California committed the same genocidal crime. Further, because malnutrition and exposure predictably lowered fertility while increasing the number of miscarriages and stillbirths, some state and federal decision makers also appear guilty of imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Finally, the state of California, slave raiders, and federal officials were all involved in forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. 3,000 to 4,000 or more California Indian children suffered such forced transfers. By breaking up families and whole indigenous communities, forced removals constituted imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. In effect, the state legalized abduction and enslavement of Indian children. Slavers exploited these indenture laws. Federal officials prevented U.S. Army intervention to protect California Indian minors, and in some cases, Slavers followed on the heels of U.S. Army campaigns to capture California Indian miners for servitude. So sufficient evidence exists then to designate the California Indian catastrophe a case 
of genocide according to the UN definition. Elected California officials were the primary architects of annihilation. But the U.S. Army also played a crucial role, first creating the exclusionary legal system, then setting genocidal precedents, helping to build the killing machine, participating in killing, and finally taking control of it. In total, United States Army military forces killed at least 1,688 to 3,741 California Indian people between 1846 and 1873, making the army actually more lethal than the state militias. Ultimately, some members of the U.S. Army, like some California state officials, were guilty of genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, and complicity in genocide. If state legislators were the main architects of this man-made catastrophe, federal officials helped to lay the groundwork. They became the final arbiters of the design, and they ultimately paid for most of its official execution. Thus, some federal officials were also directly involved in this process. Like California Indian people, Native Americans throughout the Western Hemisphere suffered devastating population declines following the invasion of newcomers. Before contact, perhaps five million or more indigenous people inhabited what is now the continental United States. But by 1900, federal census takers counted fewer than 250,000 survivors. As in California, diseases, colonialism, and war all played important roles. But something more sinister may also have been to blame. Now, academics have long debated whether or not some groups of indigenous peoples in the United States, if not the nation as the whole, was a site of genocide. And there are two factors that really polarize this American genocide debate, which is a debate that can take in the entire Western Hemisphere. The first is that the participants do not agree on what genocide means. Some want to limit the protected groups, some want to limit the crimes, some want to change the wording on intent, or some want to expand all of those categories. But the UN Genocide Convention is more than an abstract academic concept. It is, in fact, an international legal treaty signed by 147 nations. And a growing body of international case law supports it. So it remains the only authoritative international legal definition. <clears throat> but there's also another problem happening in this debate, and that is a question of framing. Some of the participants in the American genocide debate insist on framing what we're analyzing as the entirety of the Americas, both continents, from 1492 to the present. Now, what I will argue to you tonight is that this is a case of lumping everything together when we should be separating things and looking at particular case studies. Now, the direct and deliberate killing of California Indian people between 1846 and 1873 was more lethal and more sustained than anywhere else in the United States or its colonial antecedents. But there remains a profound need for additional case studies addressing other regions and peoples within and beyond these United States. What happened in California is not exactly what happened everywhere else. The variables present here did not recur in precisely the same combinations or at the same intensities everywhere else in the hemisphere. We need to build on our existing knowledge of indigenous history with new research in order to better understand the full picture for the United States, North America, and the Western Hemisphere as a whole. But I hope that this book will prevent scholars, perhaps some of you, with a workable definition, a workable methodology for examining potential cases of genocide in the Americas and beyond. 
The UN Genocide provides scholars with a standardized, internationally recognized rubric and a coherent legal definition that may be consistently applied across time and space. I think that we need to evaluate each and every potential case in consistent terms. Just as important, we need to analyze each on a case-by-case -case or region-by-region -region basis, both nationally and internationally, to create a scholarly precision in our use of what is undoubtedly an explosive term. And to seriously consider the balance between the five genocidal crimes enumerated in the convention and factors like epidemic disease. I'm not claiming that what happened in California happened everywhere. But I do hope that this book points the field toward clear and consistent definitional standards and applications. Native American people experienced and responded to invasion and colonization in many, many different ways. Rigorously examining this range of cases using the Genocide Convention to evaluate both genocidal intent and genocidal crimes will help to move the discussion of genocide in the United States and in the Americas as a whole toward clarity. Unbraiding each region's story from the tapestry of Native American history and bringing each into sharper, specific relief will create a clearer, more vivid portrait of Native American experiences and of the history of the Americas. Such investigations will be painful, but they will help all Americans, both Indian and non-Indian, to make more accurate sense of their pasts and themselves. Thank you.